Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just looking into the virtual theater, it's uh, funny to see that even in virtual reality that people tend not want to want to sit up in the front row. Uh, so, but welcome all. Uh, I, I'm excited to have the opportunity uh, to talk to you all today. Oh. <laughs> Everyone's going up now. Hey, wait, wait. Uh, so today, you know, I have about 20 minutes to speak. And what I really wanted to focus on, I, you know, Tanya talked to, about my career as a WGA screenwriter. And the other side of my career is I work a lot as a develop, creative development consultant for indie producers, for screenwriters, for potential investors. And, you know, I've been on both sides of the creative development spectrum in terms of what makes a, a script good and also, more importantly, what makes a script sellable and what makes a script a movie. And, you know, today I want to talk about distill it down to three, three kind of bullet points where I feel like no matter the scripts that I have dealt with in my life or helped develop or write myself, now through my own mistakes that I've made, I find that these three kind of notes, these thoughts are really the things that I always ask myself up front. And when I begin a project or if someone is giving me a script to read, more often than not, probably around 80% of a script's problems involve these potential three issues. So you can think of this as a kind of diagnosis toolkit we're gonna dive in today. The first big point I would say is when you're thinking about writing a script, you've written a script, you're getting okay notes or what have you, you know there's an issue is, have you set up your characters and a lot of that has to do with the protagonist to maximize their emotional journey? What I mean by that is more often than not, for the most part, the genre of your script is, and the effectiveness of your script is probably going to be defined, defined by the point of view of your protagonist or other characters. To me, point of view, the longer I've been in this business, the more important it takes. You know, like I said, so many scripts have the wrong point of view. And what do I mean by point of view? I'll take a, a movie uh, from 1988, uh, Big, starring Tom Hanks. If, if you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic movie. I would see it. It's basically Tom Hanks is a kid. He makes a wish to be big. He turns into an adult. Now, Big is, may, is a delightful coming-of-age comedy with some romance. The tone is light. It's funny. But this is where point of view comes in. Um, where play is such an important part. Imagine the reason that big can be funny and can have that joy is because we're always in the Tom Hanks character point of view. Meaning for the kid, he is having the time of his life. He's big, he's, he has freedom, all of that. Now for a moment, think about the reverse of it. From the mother's point of view, big is a horror movie. In fact, what I think is interesting about Big is they have, you can, I don't know, you know, if it's on streaming or whatever, there's a sort of extended cut uh, of Big that you can watch that actually includes scenes of the mother from her point of view talking to the police. And what's interesting is it, you know, while the scenes are all done, it really gives a different vibe to a movie because you don't want to be thinking about someone in emotional pain. That kind of ruins the fun of Tom Hanks going to FAO Schwartz and playing the piano or him, you know, going on dates. And so that to me is one of the best uh, encapsulations of the power of point of view, because in the end, point of view equals more often than not the genre of the movie you're in. Big is the example. It's a comedy because it's from the kid's point of view. If you put it in the mother's point of view, suddenly her kid has disappeared. Where is he? She's getting weird calls from someone who says, I'm your kid. It's a Blumhouse horror thriller. And that's one of the things I remember I kind of realized it, came, it crystallized in my own writing as I was writing a horror script and there wasn't something that was working about it. And what I realized is my point of view is off. I had the characters in this horror script, instead of being scared, sort of laughing off or saying sarcastic comments about what was happening. As soon as I switched it, 
the tone switched because again, you want to be in your point of view. I want to talk a little bit about probably the filmmaker. And I think one of the reasons he is one of our greatest filmmakers is because his mastery of point of view is Steven Spielberg. You know, I think you can see how he utilizes point of view probably better than any filmmaker out there. For example, and I'm going to kind of go through a couple of his movies just for you to think about. E.T. Why E.T. is essentially a version of a boy and his dog. You know, a, a young kid who's isolated, lonely. He finds a friend in an alien. The reason E.T. works is because Elliot is never, ever scared of E.T. That's why it can be a family film. That's why young kids can like it because there's never a moment except maybe the like the very first moment he meets it that E.T. is ever scary to Elliot. Imagine on the reverse end, you know, two movies that I think about is Poltergeist came out the same year as E.T. In that, it's reversed where the ghosts are seemingly, you know, malevolent presences. They're not meant to be seen with awe and wonderment. Another example of using Spielberg and Aliens is War of the Worlds. Uh, my daughter, who's five, has been obsessively watching it. I thought it was going to be too intense for her, but she loves it. And what's brilliant about War of the Worlds is that he utilizes two protagonists, Tom Cruise's point of view and Dakota Fanning's point of view. And each scene, Tom Cruise is sort of playing an everyman, but also a, a, a sort of someone who's not necessarily afraid, who's very capable. So in the scenes, it's it's amazing to watch him go from Tom Cruise's point of view down to Dakota Fanning's point of view, where, you know, every scene you watch is like if the aliens are coming, he's pushing in on a close up of her again and again to maximize the point of view of the scene. And it because if she's scared, we're going to be scared. Uh, a comparison that came around the, the, the same time where I think that kind of it, it gave it mixed reviews is Spielberg's film AI Artificial Intelligence about a, a, a robot boy. And what's interesting about that is the point of view is from a child, but the child lacks emotions. You know, the child really isn't scared about the situations, whether it's the flesh fair or what have you, that he's going into. And I think a lot of the mixed reviews of AI, and depending on your reaction, because everybody was like, oh, there's something weird and slightly disturbing about AI, AI. And I think that's where it is, because it's a child experience, but it's things like the mother saying, I don't love you, all this stuff, but this child doesn't have emotions. And I think that's why, in, in kind of Spielberg's over that it, it, it feels off tonally. Like to me, I find that really engaging because how do you create a movie about, from a protagonist point of view who doesn't have emotions? He has a strong want, which is always important, which is, you know, getting his mommy. And, you know, another version of the point of view of Spielberg, which to me is maybe his one of his master classes in really watching how point of view works is Jurassic Park. Because Jurassic Park, he utilizes several different points of view to then change the tone of what's happening. We open the teaser of Jurassic Park is the workers at Jurassic Park. They're trying to take out that raptor and it's scary. You know, the raptor eats the person. So we're watching the point of view of the workers who are terrified of what's happening. Then the first time we see dinosaurs, because Spielberg wants to give us a sense of awe and wonderment, this is amazing. The first time we see dinosaurs, whose point of view are we in? We're in the po point of view of the paleontologist, you know, Grant and uh, Dr. Ellie, played by Sam Neill and Laura Dern. They're experts on dinosaurs. So when they see the dinosaurs, when they look up and see that Brachiosaurus, because they're experts about dinosaurs, they're inherently not afraid of dinosaurs. They're looking at their experts so they can love what they see. Then, and this is what I find is interesting about Spielberg, after that, then he introduces the kids. Could have just as easily had the kids in the helicopter with them when they're landing. Why didn't he is because I think he wanted to use, and point of view is always important about keeping it fresh, you know, because if you see a monster for the first time, you're maximizing the scariness. But so the kids really don't have, they have the Triceratops interaction, but again, that Triceratops is sick. The first time the kids really see dinosaurs, it's the T-Rex. And that's maximizing the scariness of it. 
Just imagine, because it wouldn't be as scary, probably, if the kids were in the Jeep with them and they saw dinosaurs, the Brachiosaurus with everyone else, because then they would have that experience. That's why the point of view, it, it connects to not only your character's point of view, but ideally you want to maximize that point of view. That if if it's, if it's you want someone to be really scared about something, it, you know, you want them to experience it for the first time. And more often than not, so many of the scripts that I read, that I help develop, this is, you know, in, in so many movies you watch, I would encourage you to watch movies because the thing is, there's plenty of movies out there, but what makes Spielberg so great is his mastery of point of view. And every one of his movies, he uses this in a way that very few directors ever do or writers ever do. So, you know, number one of the three things I would say is always try to maximize your protagonist and the other character's point of view. If you're writing a horror film, you want to make sure your protagonist is set up to be really scared by what's happening. You know, and also that comes with life experience, all of that. So you just want to utilize, think about what's the point of view? What are we watching? I, I think a, a version of that, too, that doesn't quite work with Spielberg's work is his movie 1941, which is his farce about the Japanese potentially invading Los Angeles. And there's a lot of funny, spectacular filmmaking. But why that movie, I think, doesn't quite work is comedy relies on a different point of view, a kind of outsider point of view. When we think of the great kind of comedies, usually they're people, whether it's Ghostbusters, whether it's the roles Jim Carrey plays, they're people sort of outside of the norm. So it's a point of view of a disruptor. Spielberg tends to really flourish when it's a point of view of somebody directly experiencing it. Whereas in comedy, there's an alienation effect that you want someone who has a drastically different point of view because it's, it's you know, you know someone, whatever. Eddie Murphy in Trading Place is what makes it funny is he's walking into this world that he seemingly doesn't belong in disrupting it. And that's why in 1941, comedy, I think, it, it comes harder to Spielberg because that's a disruption. Spielberg tends to want to embrace the point of view of each character to maximize the emotions. So point of view... Number one, I think maybe the most important thing in my mind in terms of creating a successful script. Number two, is your protagonist driving the story with the most effective narrative engine? Narrative engine is a term people work with me, hear me, I say all the time. And what is it? I think of narrative engine is basically it's the dynamic between how a protagonist enters the narrative, enters the story, and how they interface with the plot. Uh, it, it, it deciding a narrative engine informs you how to set up your story and helps you know if you want the protagonist to kiss or kill the husband at the break of act, into act two. You can also think of it as fi figuring out archetypal film structures. What do I need, mean by narrative engine? Here I'm going to give you a couple examples of clear narrative engines that you see in other movies. There's a version of the narrative engine that is the new kid at school slash stranger in a strange land. That's, you know, it, it, uh, this happens a lot, especially in fantasy, sci-fi. The, the, the movie, I think, that just that encapsulates it, it perfectly is James Cameron's Avatar. Think about Avatar. He could have created any of those characters could seemingly have been the main character. But who did he make his protagonist? He made a character who was in a wheelchair, who had never been to this planet, had no idea. Why does he do that? Well, because in these kind of big sci-fi fantasy movies or comic book movies that take a lot of world building, you're going to have a lot of exposition. You know, in a romantic comedy, you don't need really the exposition because it's people in New York or in L.A. or some town. It's sort of in the real world. But if you're building out a brand new world, you have to explain the rules to them. And in Avatar, he maximizes it by watching the character were in the character's eyes again point of view and each thing is new to them which organically makes it that the character other characters can say well this is the you know the chamber you go in and this happens so you're getting an organic way to tell other in otherwise would be a heavy heavy exposition and you can turn exposition into dramatic uh dramatic dialogue another Narrative engine is what I call the expert. Think Indiana Jones, Mission Impossible, James Bond. 
You know, it, basically, this is somebody, your first 10 pages of the script is somebody who knows what they're doing. We're not watching them in, like we would in a horror movie, like, oh, a normal, or a Hitchcock movie. Oh, a normal person is in over their head. We're watching Indiana Jones. We're watching Mission Impossible. We're watching James Bond because we're watching the thrill of someone doing these things. We're, so we're on the, you know, we're on the adventure with them. Same goes with like the Da Vinci Code movies. You know, it's, it's you want a protagonist who knows this stuff and, you know, we want to see them be an expert. And then the other kind of narrative engine, there's a lot of them out there that I kind of look at is what I call, and then there were none based on Agatha Christie's novel, which is your basic narrative engine from a lot of horror movies, slasher films, what have you. You know, a group of people gather and slowly they're killed off one after another. And it's either, you know, the, the knives out example is you're looking slowly, you're eliminating suspects to find who the killer is, or you're trying to avoid and, and, and conquer the killer. So that's, and then there were none. And then finally, my final big sort of bullet point of the three, if you're, you, if, when you're just looking at your script, you're saying, what's wrong with it is, does your screenplay begin at the right moment? If your first 10 pages are, aren't working, I consider where you are starting your story. More often than not in my own work, especially I, I've had this in, in the biopics I've written, I, I, you know, it's like, where do I start the story of this person's life? Do I start it? You know, I, I wrote a, a script called Gorgeous George, which was based on a famous professional wrestler in the 50s. And the real problem there was like, did I do I start it with when he was just born and do we follow it or do I start right before he's going to start wrestling or right before he's famous more often than not like I said you want to kind of search for where is the best place to really start the story and then because the, those first 10 pages they're not only it's not only about grabbing the the reader it is also importantly about those first 10 pages tell you the reader whether an executive or your friend or whatever what this movie is it's like the first 10 pages are like the tv pilot in a script it's like you know what is your world who is your protagonist and what is your want and you want to match that with the point of view and the narrative engine in a lot of ways these three work together and you know sometimes you you find you know what's the point of view connects to what's the narrative engine for example because if you want your, you know indiana jones is never really scared the the humor from indiana jones comes from when he is, you know, he's scared of snakes or he does something like that. And so those three things, point of view, narrative engine, and where does your script start? I would say always focus on that, no matter what state of development. There has been projects I've worked on that the script has gone through three or four or five iterations, different writers, and it's still like, oh, the issue is the point of view, or they don't have the right narrative engine, or it's, you know, starting at the, the wrong place. So if you can hold any like those three things, I think are probably the three most important lessons of screenwriting that I have learned during my career. Thank you.